church family. Uh, my name is Woody Hodge, and this is my wife, Charlene. We have been married for over 53 years and have attended North Star Church since 2001. Here's our story of God's love and faithfulness throughout our marriage. January 14th, 1967 is the day we were married. Careers brought us together while living in California. We spent the first few years trying to iron out not only personal differences that are deep-rooted through our different family dynamics, but those ingrained through our different cultures. Woody is from Alabama. I am from Washington State. We decided early on not to use the word divorce. We had two children, Atlanta and Alan. Looking back over the years of finding ways to overcome our differences in both parenting and our marriage, we see there was an invisible force protecting us and guiding us into dominant truths about life. Some of those truths include the necessity for commitment to each other no matter what, forgiveness to keep the pathway open to future conversation, loving and ministering to one another helped us to step away from being self-centered being trustworthy and honest with each other is essential. These truths were made possible only with the help of our big God, who became our life source a few years into our marriage. God knows what unites. I began attending a small group Bible study in our neighborhood and began sharing with Woody the awesome truths I was learning. I recognize these truths from my childhood when at 12 years old, I asked Jesus into my life. John 3.16 is a verse that comes to mind. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We committed our lives to learning more about how to follow Jesus and his way of dealing with opposing viewpoints. We began learning there really is an absolute truth about life and that we could fully trust and find unity in it. Even though we don't always agree, we increasingly recognize the supernatural power of the big God who has taught us it is okay to agree to disagree and who continually reminds us of his love and his forgiveness of sin. Once we experience the victory of working through life's battles together, we now enjoy each other and the bonding that comes from doing it together. Life is sweet in retirement from our jobs, uh, spending time with family and grandkids, traveling, volunteering, and learning more spiritual truths from our church family and life situations. To our church family, there is such a reward realizing life is about loving others and ministering to them as it says in Luke 6:38, given it would be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour out into your lip. All, All our love, Woody and Charlie. And Charlie. <laughs> <laughs>incredible story 50 something years of marriage and uh, what a testimony to each and to every one of us if you're new to North Star and this is your first time with us let me say welcome we are so glad that you're here today as we are uh, journeying together in a series that I've entitled radical relationships and when you think of the word radical oftentimes people think of extreme Uh, they think of you know the idea of radical being something crazy but if you really understand the word radical, the word radical is, uh, it comes from the Latin word that just simply means rooted in or from the original. And the idea that we're going with is that if we're going to make an impact in this next decade, because here at North Star, over these next six months, we're talking about how do we make an impact with our life? How do we make a difference in the world that we're living in? And how could this be the best decade ever? And I believe that one of the ways it can do that is through radical relationships. And so we talked about friendship last week. Today, we're going to talk about marriage. And uh, before we start that, I want to speak to singles very specifically because I think the Bible has a lot to say about singleness. And oftentimes, we overlook that or we miss that. 
So I want to encourage you to take out your message notes. That way you'll be able to follow along with me today. We're going to dive in here in just a moment. I want to begin with a passage of scripture that I'm going to talk about for a second. And we'll come, come back to it in just a minute. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, it says, We all are given different gifts. God gives the gift of marriage to some, and to others, he gives the gift of singleness. Now, if you're single, I want you to listen to this just for a second, because I think it's important. Marriage is a gift. Singleness is a gift. And God calls some people to be single, and he calls some people to be married. And there's nothing wrong with being single. Now, here's a question that I always get. People are, that are single will come to me and say, but what if I want to get married? Then more than likely, you're not called to be single. Uh, you wouldn't have the desire to be single. When God says that it's a gift, I believe that singleness is the kind of gift that a person says, you know what, I'd be okay not being married. Nothing wrong with it. I mean, I, I love married people. I love the married life. But I want to be single, and I'm going to live the rest of my life single. And I believe that it's a gift that God gives to some, that some choose to be single. And if that's you, I just want to say this. Don't be ashamed of that. It's a gift that God has given to you just as God gives the gift of marriage. But here's the thing I think we all need to understand, and especially with the culture that we live in. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says, Marriage should be honored by, say that word out loud with me, everyone. That's right. Everyone should honor marriage. Marriage is to be honored. It's important for us to understand why God created it and the gift that he has given to us and how beautiful the gift is. You see, out of marriage, what God intended for you and what God intended for me inside of my marriage, and for those of us who proclaim to be followers of Jesus, he wants our marriages to be an example or a picture to the world around us of what his relationship to the church really looks like. Now, I don't know about you, when you think of it in that context, it puts a tremendous amount of weight on our relationship with our spouse. And it makes us realize that God created marriage as something that is to be an example to the world that is looking. So that when people look at your marriage, and when people look at my marriage, and they're not followers of Jesus... It would create inside of them a, a desire, a want to, a, a, a picture of what God's love for the church was really like. And I think Woody and Charlene did an incredible job of illustrating that for us and the way that they've chosen to live out their lives and the choices that they've made over the years to be able uh, to do that. Today, I'm going to do something a little different. I've never taught marriage in the way that I'm going to teach it today. Now, I'm smart enough to know there's some older gentleman sitting out there going, boy, let me tell you something, with those little boots on that you've got and that nice little shirt, you ain't going to teach me nothing about marriage. I've been married 60-something years. Okay, I get that. And um, I will say, I believe you. Uh, you probably could teach me a lot about marriage. I've been married 30 years this June. Angela and I will celebrate 30 years together. Absolutely incredible. And let me tell you, uh, she is a saint because she has had to put up with me uh, these past 30 years. God love her and well, all that she's had to put up with over these years. Today, what I want to do is I want to talk about marriage from the idea and the concept of seasons. Now, the reason I want to do this, and, and just stay with me for a second, let me tell you why I decided to come from this angle, is because after the storm that we went through, Hurricane Michael, I began to think about life and seasons. Life is, is in seasons. In fact, the Bible talks about that. We're going to look at that in just a moment. And, and I want to talk about marriage in the context of seasons. There are four seasons we're going to look at, just like we have seasons in the world that we live in. We're going to talk about spring. Spring represents that time when you're busy inside of marriage. Don't write that down. We're going to come back to it in just a second. Uh, the other season we're going to talk about is summer. This is the good stage of marriage. This is the time that everybody enjoys. This is when your marriage is great and flowers are blooming and life is good and everything seems to be perfect. And then we're going to talk about fall. Fall is all about change. And there's two types of change we're going to talk about. There's good change and there's difficult change that comes in life. And how do you embrace that and how do you get through that season? And then we're going to talk about winter. And winter is a time of loss. Winter is a time when you go through the really, really tough stuff in life and it really begins to test you and your relationship and the, and the marriage that you have. Now, what I want to do is I want to begin with a passage of scripture that talks very specifically about this idea of seasons. 
In fact, I love what it says here because the writer of Ecclesiastes was considered one of the smartest men to ever live. He's looking at life and he's thinking about it and he's writing from this perspective. He said, for everything, I want you to say that word out loud with me, for everything, notice, he didn't say some things, he didn't say some stuff in life, he used the word everything. He said, everything, there is a season, there's a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up. He goes on and says there's a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away. There's a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear down and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, and a time of war and a time for peace. I don't know about you, but that covers just about everything, doesn't it? He says there is a season, there is a time for everything in life. And I really believe that if you're here today and you're just married, maybe you're younger, uh, maybe today I'm going to give you some insight to some things that I think you're going to face in the future that's going to happen as long as you're married. For those of you that are older, you're just going to shake your head as I talk and go, yep, been through that season, yep, been through that season, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about there. Some of you are going to go, that's where we are right now. We're in this season of life. And that's exactly what Angela and I talked about this week, the season that we feel like we're in currently in our own lives personally. The first season that I want us to look at is what I call the springtime season. It's the season of busyness, if you want to write that down. Now, this is important because we all go through these seasons. It's a season where we get busy and we're like two ships passing in the night, right? Because life is just full and life is busy. You don't talk, you don't have time to talk, you don't have time to do the things that are important, you don't have time to think, you don't have time for intimacy, you don't have time to just be together because you're so busy going around from different thing to different thing. In fact, those of you that have preschoolers, let me just tell you this, you're in a season of spring right now. Uh, it's probably the busiest time of your life. You're thinking to yourself, I never thought it was going to be this difficult. But let me just tell you this. It's important to understand that the season of busyness is a season that can be very dangerous if you're not careful. In each of these seasons, what I'm going to do is to give you some tips that Angela and I learned through mentors and reading and other things that have happened in our life over the years that hopefully will be beneficial to you. What do you do during this season? What are the things that, that you need to be aware of and what is it that you can do in order to build the kind of relationship that God has uniquely designed for you to build inside of marriage? There's a season. And in this season, there are some things that you have to do. In fact, let me just say it this way. In a, during this season, you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional. Now, I'm going to talk about that for a second because some of you, I can say that, but you need specific illustrations of how to be intentional. This is a season of busyness. It's a season of where things are just kind of out of control. You're running from ball games and you're going back and forth and work maybe has put a, more of a load on you. And let me just say this. Many of us are coming out of a season of busyness just because of where we live and what's happened in the last year. It's been a busy season in your life. Angela and I were talking about this the other night and we were thinking back about, man, it seems like every waking moment that we've had has been working and then going home and working on the house and then trying to get things accomplished. And I've been to Lowe's probably 17,000 times in the last year. I, I probably could own the place by now. I, it's just unbelievable to me how much time we've spent trying to get our lives back together. It's a busy season. In this season, there are three things that I've learned over the years. I'm going to give them to you that we've just kind of tried to practice. Divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually. Those are three things that you have to be intentional about. Let me explain those to you. Divert daily just simply means this. It means that you do something fun every day together. Now, I'm not talking about you got to go on a date. I'm not talking about like you got to go out and do something, you know, in, in the community. I'm saying every day you find a way to have fun together. You divert daily. You take a little bit of time to say, we're going to have time for us. In fact, when our kids were little, for those of you that have preschoolers, 
Angela and I used to practice this principle. When I would come home from work, she would say to the kids, this is mom and dad time. We usually tried to spend about 10 minutes together just so we could kind of reconnect. We would take our kids and we literally would place them in their rooms and say, you play for the next 10 minutes. Mom and dad are going to have couch time. And our kids got used to this. We would go in, we would sit down on the couch. I know some of you right now are thinking that would never happen in my home. Uh, Well, it it was difficult, but we made it happen. And and what we would do is we would spend time together connecting and, and really just doing something fun together, talking about what happened at work, talking about how her day's been. And the two of us would reconnect so that we would be able to have time for each other and time for our relationship. The second thing is withdrawal weekly. This is a weekly day off. Now, I know for some of you, maybe you're in a season right now where that just can't possibly happen. But I want to tell you this, God commanded it. He said there is to be a time for 24 hours that you take a break from what you do for a living. It's an opportunity for you not only to recharge yourself, but it's an opportunity for you and your spouse to be together. For the two of you to have quality time with each other. For you to be able to take a day off and to rest together and to focus on your relationship with each other. And I want to just say something here that's very, very important. Mom and Dad, I want you to know that your kids are important, but your relationship with each other is far more important than your kids. You show me a great, you show me a great marriage, I'll show you great kids. If you want your mar- if you want your kids to turn out great, work hard on your marriage. Spend time doing the things that you need to do together so that you can connect with each other and make sure that you do that weekly. And then abandon annually. That's just where you take a vacation. And, and you know, I love Pastor Roy. One of the things that he teaches here to our staff, every year in January, he says, you need to go ahead and schedule out your vacation because it's important. Because if you don't put it on the calendar, guess what? You probably are never going to do it. And so we just try to sit down and say, hey, what's the time that you're going to take off? How are you going to be intentional? Because in this season, it's important for us to become intentional if we're going to be able to get out of this season and we're going to be able to grow together in our relationship. Now, here's what I want to say to you as your pastor, all right? And I tried to figure a creative way to do this this week and I couldn't, I couldn't pull it off fast enough. But I want to tell you that if you are here today and you are married, you need to date each other weekly. You need to date each other weekly. In fact, here's a command from your pastor because I love you. You need to go on a date this week. That is the number one thing that I'm going to ask you to do. Because a couple that dates together is a couple that will stay together. In fact, over the years as I've counseled, I've had tons of people come into my office, and they'll ask me, what is the one thing that we can do in order to work on our marriage? And I'll tell them, a date night every week. You need to spend time dating each other because that is the very thing that brought you together. It's the very thing that attracted you to one another when you began that journey together. So you've got to spend time dating. I've had couples in recent weeks, knowing that I was going to preach on marriage, say to me, one of the best things you ever taught us was to begin to date weekly. It's changed our relationship. It's changed our marriage. And it's better today because we begin to practice that in our lives. In fact, I so believe in it, if I could have pulled it off this week, I'd have paid for every one of you to go on a date this week. I was trying to figure out how to make that happen, because that's how much I believe in it, because I believe that it will make a difference in your life. So we have springtime. It's a time where things are busy, life gets busy, we're going crazy, trying to accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished. The second season we have is what I call the summer season. It's the season of greatness. Now, what do I mean by greatness? This is the season where everything's going right. In fact, it's a season where, man, your marriage is stronger than it's ever been. I mean, all of us, if we're honest, don't you look forward to the summer? I love the summer season. I love being able to go to the beach. I love being able to fish and to get outside and to do the things that that I love to do, that, that Angela and I love to do together. And you see, this is the time and the period in your relationship which everything is going great. Now, this usually is a short season. It's not a long season, but it is a very important season. And here's why it's so important. During this season, you've got to be willing to do some things to invest in your marriage that will help you as you enter into other seasons of life. In fact, I put it this way. I put uh, in this season, during this season, you've got to bank and invest in your future. You have to bank and invest in your future. Now, What did the Bible tell us a few moments ago? It says there's a season for everything. There's a season to invest. 
There's a season to gather. There's a season to scatter. There's a season to laugh together. There's a season to cry together. And during this particular season, what I'm saying is, this is a season that you bank in and you invest in your future. This is where you say, we're going to be intentional to invest for our future because we know that some hard times are coming, that there's going to be some difficulties in life for us. And so what do you do? You begin to say, all right, let's figure out some ways that we can begin to invest because what Scripture says is there's a time to plant and there's a time to reap. There's a time to invest in your relationship. There's the easy, breezy time when everything's going well. And let me tell you what happens during this season. During this summer season, if we're not careful, we'll breeze through it. We'll make no investments for the future. And all of a sudden, we'll get into a winter season and we'll begin to look back and go, what in the world has happened? You see, when you're on top of the world, think about this, financially, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, when things are going great, it's in those seasons that you begin to invest for the future that you don't know is coming and what's going to happen that you can't see down the road. So in this season, I want to encourage you to invest in the relationship. How do you do that? Here's some ways that you can do that. Counseling. Now, let me say this. I'm smart enough that as soon as I use that word, there's some men that just checked out. Guys, I've been pastoring for 30 years. I want to tell you something. This is the season where you get in counseling and you begin to work on some stuff together before the bad season comes. You see, most of us as men, if we're not careful, we don't take the car in, or at least I don't. Let me just talk about me personally. You know, my idea of maintaining the car is you drive it till the engine falls out, then you take it in to the the shop. That's not very wise. I've learned that over the years. What do you do? You take it in for maintenance. What do you do? You make sure you keep up with the log and you do the things that are necessary in order that the car runs and that it doesn't break down. It's the same in marriage. You've got to get into counseling in these good seasons. I'm not saying that you've got to go for six or eight weeks. But guys, can I tell you something? Men, I just want to be really honest with you. In 30 years, ladies, please understand something. Men have to be hit with a two-by-four. We don't get it sometimes. And in 30 years, it's been amazing to me the number of guys that will walk in my office and say, she's been asking me for two years to go to counseling. I wouldn't go with her. And now, Pastor Marty, she walked out. And I look at them and I say, it's too late. She's been asking you for two years, and you said no. There's a season. There's a season, and the season is the summer season. When things are great, you begin to invest by going to counseling, but not only counseling, you do marriage seminars. You find a marriage seminar that you can go to. You go on a cruise together, and you begin to invest in your relationship, and you begin to work on some of the things that you need to work on, knowing that there is a winter season that is coming, knowing that there is a fall season that is coming. We're going to invest during this season when things are great. We're going to work on stuff that maybe we don't really need to work on, but we're going to work on it anyways so that we can have a strong marriage, so that when the winds begin to blow and the winter season comes... We've got roots that are deep and an opportunity where we have grown together so that we can do what? We can get through the storms of life and we can make it together during these difficult times. Not only that, you can read books together. The guys, I know this. I mean, I'm smart enough to know this. Men hardly ever read books. Um, you know, that's why they created, uh, you know, books on tape or books on CD or whatever it is. Uh, you can listen to it in the car. And a podcast, I think, a, a, is a great way for you to be able to do that. But you invest during this season so that as the other seasons come, you're able to make it through those seasons in life. I'm going to talk about that here in just a moment. The third season that we often go through is what I call the fall season. And I want you to notice, fall is the season of change. Now, I want to talk about this in two ways. There's good change. And there's change that is unexpected or, or the, the, the probably will never happen. It's two different types of change. And I think we have to understand both of these. Some change is good. I mean, like maybe when you've moved or you've taken a new job. Maybe you just got married or, or, or maybe there's some, some new opportunity or adventure that you're taking together. And inside of that adventure, there comes change. Now, it's easy sometimes to embrace that kind of change. It's easy to say, hey, we're on a new adventure. You know, we just got married. We're moving to a new city. You got a new job. I mean, maybe a baby's coming along, and, and, and it's a season where change begins to happen in your life. Now, it's important to understand that change always creates stress. Let's just be honest. I, I don't care if it's good change. 
change, it creates stress, because it means that life is different. It means that we're going to be living differently. But see, let's talk about the kind of change that is the kind of change that does, doesn't allow change to happen in life. Let me just illustrate this for you for a second. You see, Angela and I have been married 30 years. There's some things that I know are not going to change about Angela, and that's okay. I just know that like, I married her and, and that God has uniquely given her her personality and gifts and abilities. And Angela knows that there are some things about me that probably are never going to change. And, and what do you do? What do you do when you love someone and you, you say, man, like, that just ain't changing. Like, like they're just, they're just going to, I mean, it just seems like they're just going to be that way the rest of our life. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't work on things, but there are some things that just aren't going to change. And what do you do in those moments? Well, I think there's some, about three or four things you can do. Let me just say it this way. I think the first thing you've got to do is during this season, you've got to look for the positives. You, you've got to focus on the things that are good inside of the relationship. You've got to look at the positive things about each other. Because when change begins to happen, if you're not careful, you can get negative very quickly. You can get negative towards each other. You can begin to blame each other. You can begin to say things that you don't mean. And so it's important that during this season, the way that you begin to deal with these things is you begin to say, I'm going to look for the positives. Now, how do you do that? There's three things I want to show you here that I think are important. The first way is stop using incompatibility as an excuse. Now, let me just tell you what I mean by that. See, I believe the word incompatibility was, was like some lawyer, divorce lawyer somewhere, said here's how we're going to be able to let people get a divorce. They're incompatible. Can I tell you something? Everybody is incompatible with everybody else. Some of y'all didn't like that. See, so some of you that are single, you're going, no, 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 I'm going to find somebody that's compatible with me. Can I tell you something? As long as you live on this earth, you will never be 100% compatible with somebody else. There are things about you they're not going to like. There are things about you that probably are not going to change. You see, incompatibility. Somebody asked me one time, they said, Pastor, you know, we just seem like we're incompatible. Now, some of you, this is why most of you don't come to counseling with me anymore. But let me just tell you what I told them. I said, grow up. You're always going to be incompatible. You know what Angela and I decided years ago? We decided that we were just going to be compatibly incompatible. It's okay. There are things about her that she probably would love to change that aren't going to change. There are things about me that she probably would love to change that aren't going to change. And we've just said we can agree to disagree, but we're going to do it agreeably. Compatibility, incompatibility. Don't use it as an excuse. Number two, realize that love is a choice. You see, in this season, you've got to say to yourself, love's a choice. Love is not an emotion, and love is not a feeling. An emotion and feelings are neither right or wrong. They, they're going to come, and they're going to go, right? Love is a choice. I get up every day, and I choose to love God. I get up every day, and I choose to love my kids. I get up every day, and I choose to love my wife. There are days that I may not feel like I'm in love. There are days that I may not want to love. But I have to make a choice. It's a choice that I make. And in this season, you've got to make the choice. You've got to say, hey, you know what? There's a lot of change going on. Life is difficult. Things aren't the same the way we thought they were going to be. And, and what we're going to do is even though you're not changing and even though I'm not changing, we're still going to love each other. We're going to love each other. We're going to care for each other. We're going to be devoted to each other. And you make a commitment to stick with it during that season. The third thing is this. You've got to choose forgiveness. Let me just make a statement. I think this is important. I want you to hear this. Great marriages are built on forgiveness. That's what a great marriage is. You can forgive one another just as Christ has forgiven you. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians. Forgive one another in the same way that Jesus Christ has forgiven you. That's the way that we forgive each other. And great marriages are built on forgiveness. It's the ability to be able to forgive i got to tell you, man, through the years, Angel's had to forgive me of a lot of stuff. I mean, and I've had to forgive her of some things. Probably a lot less for her because she's a prince and she gets it right almost, a princess, I'm sorry, and she gets it right every single time. And I'm not saying that, I'm being serious. Angela is an angel. In fact, her grandmother used to call her Angel. That was her nickname, Angel, Angel Angela. And, and she is in so many ways. But she has chosen to forgive me and I have chosen to forgive her. And that forgiveness not only helps us to grow together, 
but it helps our relationship become stronger. And in the season that, that you're in, uh, when, when you find yourself in the fall season and change is coming, you have to be willing to offer forgiveness to each other. The last season, this is the most difficult. This is what I call the winter season, the season of loss. Now, there's all kinds of loss. Some of you immediately think about, well, the loss of a loved one. Well, let me just tell you this. It, it's far more than that. This is the season of grief. It's a season of loss. It's when an affair happens, a betrayal happens inside of a relationship. There can be a death, bankruptcy, cancer, mental illness. There are all kinds of problems. It's a season of where maybe your child gets placed in prison and you're just absolutely heartbroken. And all of us, if you've been married very long, have been through one of these seasons. In fact... For Angela and I, many of you know the story, one of these seasons came in uh, uh, 2011 for us when Angela was diagnosed with cancer, probably one of the most difficult seasons of our life. Um, I'll be honest with you, uh, it, it was probably, uh, pro probably a lot harder than she and I ever thought because up to that point, uh, we had not had a whole lot of uh, winter seasons in our marriage. And it was that season that began to change everything. It was that season that, that we began to realize what it was like to walk through the, a tunnel of darkness. A tunnel when you didn't know what was going to happen and you had no control over and you weren't sure if you were going to be able to make it to the other side. Now let me tell you some things that we did when we first got married, and I think this is important before I move on. Angela and I, when we, when we signed our marriage license, we shut the door on divorce. It was never an option for us. We said not only are we going to close the door, we're going to double lock it, we're going to tie it up with a chain, and that word will never be used in our relationship together. We just said, that's not a word. In fact, to me, it's a, it's a cuss word in our home. We just don't use it. We, just, we have never threatened each other with divorce. Only reason I was able to do that is because I had a mentor and a pastor who went through a divorce, and he told me if he could change anything in his life, the one thing that he would do is he would go back and he would never use that word because he said when you start using it, it's easier and easier to say it, and it becomes a reality far quicker than you want it to. And it was just important. We just said, no, we're not going to allow that to be a part. And so I've got to tell you, and I'm going to speak for myself. I'm not going to speak for Angela because she's not up here with me today. Uh, but I, I will tell you, she's sitting right back there. She's listening to every word I'm saying. But I can tell you this. I can tell you that there have been some moments where we've had some big, huge arguments in our marriage. So y'all look at Pastor Marty and go, oh, they're perfect. They don't have any problems. Now, let me tell you something. We have the same problems you do. We put our pants on the same way you put your pants on, and we live in the same way that most of you live your life. And there have been moments that I can honestly say that we've had big fights, and we've had disagreements, and we've had things that were terrible going on, and moments where we were struggling. And, and I've never said to myself, hey, I just want to throw in the towel and be done. Now, Angela, I asked her one time, I said, have you ever thought about divorce? She said, divorce, no. Murder, possibility. Y'all know her well enough. She's just straightforward. She just tells me all the time. She says, you know, I, I mean, that, that, that's an easy one. Um, I, I, you know, I remind her, I, I tell her all the time, if you ever get a gun and you decide to shoot me, let me know because I'm not coming home. Um, you, you, but the, the reality, the reality is we all have these seasons. Let me tell you some things that are important in this, in this time of season of loss. Here's the thing you've got to understand. This season is you've got to choose not to destroy each other. Now guys, this is difficult. I, I, in fact, I'm going to sit down for this one because I want to get this across. You see, what I've learned over the years is that when it gets difficult and loss begins to be experienced and life gets uncontrollable, this is when individuals and couples begin to attack one another. Rather than being on the same team and rather than being together, they begin to attack each other. Our child wouldn't have died if you'd have done this. Our marriage wouldn't have fallen apart and you wouldn't have betrayed me if you would have done this. This wouldn't have happened in our financial life if you would have made better decisions. And the finger pointing begins and all of a sudden, rather than being on the same team, they become opposed to one another. This is a season where you have to dig in. It's a season where you literally have to say to each other, we're not going to destroy each other. We're going to make a choice to stand together no matter what happens. Now, I know some of you are thinking, Pastor, you don't understand. You, you haven't been through some of the things that I've been through. Let me just tell you a couple things in this season. The first one is this. Decide that divorce is not an option and never use that word. I said that just a few moments ago. But I want to say to you that I think it's important that you make this decision. We're not going to talk about that. That's not, that's not even an option for us. The second thing is this. Practice absolute honesty. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. You see, the reason that this season is a season of growth, and, and let me just go a little bit further and say this, 
the season of loneliness, the season of darkness, the season of winter is what creates the greatest intimacy. Don't miss this. The reason it creates great intimacy is because it requires absolute honesty. This is where people have to begin to talk about things they've been unwilling to talk about, to have conversations that maybe they've avoided over the years, to begin to talk about what life would be like maybe without each other because maybe someone's been diagnosed with cancer, or there's an illness or, or, or a mental problem that's going on. It begins to lead to conversations that you never would have had had you not gone through this season. And what does it do? It creates greater intimacy. Absolute honesty paves the way to intimacy. You've heard me say it uh, probably 50,000 times over the last 25 years here at North Star. And this is the season that absolute honesty begins to set in, where you begin to talk honestly and open with each other. And here's the last part that I would tell you, because this was, was big for us. This is where we would begin to say, never judge feelings. Make a commitment to not try and talk your spouse out of a feeling. Now, man, look up here for just for a second, right? We're fixers. And man, when our wives come to us and they're feeling something, what we want to do is we want to fix it. And what they need from us is just to validate the emotion or the feeling that they're experiencing. See, li listen to me for a second. I I'm telling you, I've made this mistake a thousand times. I try to fix Angela. I try to fix the problem. I try to fix the situation. And it took me years to figure it out that what she needs is for me just not to judge her feelings because feelings are never right or wrong. They're just feelings. It's just emotions. And what we do is we try to say, you can't feel that way. You know, you, you, you should feel differently. I mean, why are you so angry? I don't understand why you, you feel so angry. It, it's not about whether they're right or wrong. It's about being able to say to her and her being able to say to me, hey, I don't understand how you feel the way that you do right now, but I'm okay with it. And I could see in this situation where maybe, you know, you're angry and you're uptight and you don't feel like you love me right now. I get that. Because can I tell you something? You know in your mind that you probably won't be absolutely honest. And some of you are going to go home today and say, hey, I heard Pastor Marty say this. Can I ask you a question? Don't do that. If you do, just blame it on me, okay? That, 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 that'll heal your marriage in and of itself. Just say it's Pastor Marty's fault. He, he did it. But see, there are moments that all of us probably don't feel like we love someone. That's emotions and feelings. Love is a choice. It's a decision I make every day. And guess what? The feelings and the emotions follow the decision. That's just the way it is. And you see, I want to say to you that in the winter season, it is a time where, yes, it is hard because you're going through probably the most difficult circumstances and situations you could ever go through. But the reality is this. It creates the greatest intimacy as you hunker down and you work through it together and you begin to get honest with each other and you deal with it in a way that honors God and it begins to honor your relationship and it builds strength inside of your relationship. Now before I close the day, let me just say this. There are some singles sitting out there today going, good Lord. If that's what marriage is like, then I don't know. Can I tell you something? Anything in life worth having is hard work. That's just the reality. See, everything takes hard work. And let me just tell you this, because I think this is important. Uh, th the greatest gift that you can give to each other is to love each other unconditionally. That's the way God loves you. And you see, if you're single, I don't want you to be discouraged. In fact, there's some of you that are sitting out there today and you're like, man, I just don't know. And I want to just tell you this. I want to tell you because, you know, I, if I'm just really honest, I, I probably would not have said this earlier, but I just want to tell you this. Marriage is a beautiful, beautiful thing. In fact, Angela didn't know I was going to say this, but I'm going to say this. I am so glad that God put Angela and I together. Because can I tell you something? 30 years ago, I was a different person than I am today. And I am who I am today, mostly because of her unconditional love for me and what she has done in my life over the past 30 years. That's the beauty of marriage when it begins to work together. You understand what I'm saying? And you see, I want you as a single person to know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And if he puts you in a marriage relationship, it is a gift. 
And if you understand the seasons and you go through those seasons the way God wants you to go through those seasons, marriage becomes a beautiful picture of God's love for the church and God's love for you and for me. And that's the way that we're to love each other. Marriage is a wonderful thing. But can I tell you something, and I want you to hear my heart here. The reason that I chose to preach this on this Sunday and, 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 and during this season is because I was sitting in a meeting about three or four months ago, and I was told by all of the mental counselors and all the people in our community that the number one issue our community was having right now was marriages. Now, I know the only people that I can speak to are the people that go to North Star. I wish God would give me a platform that was bigger so I could speak to our entire county and say, guys, we can make it through this. It's okay. Because guess what? Some of us have come out of a season of loss. Some of us have come out of a season of busyness. And if we just know what season we're in and we practice the principles of God's word, it's amazing what will begin to happen as we begin to live it out. Because here's what we believe here at North Star. When Jesus is at the center of your life, your life is better. And when he's at the center of your marriage, your marriage is better. And when he's at the center of your family, your family is better. And when he's at the center of our church, our church is better. And when he's at the center of our community, our community is better. And I just want you to have the kind of marriage that God has uniquely designed for you to experience and to have. To practice the seasons, to see them coming, and to do the things that are necessary to make them through so that your marriage can be a great marriage, a radical marriage, rooted in the truth and the love of God's word as you begin to live it out. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you've given us marriage, that it's a beautiful thing, and that God... We are able to experience it in a way that only you can give it to us. Because, God, you designed it. You created it. You put it uh, here on planet Earth. And, God, you are the author and the creator of what marriage should be. And it's only that when we look to you that, God, we really begin to experience the kind of marriages that you want us to experience. And so, Father, I am smart enough to know that there are some people that are here today. And, God... The problem that they're having in their marriage is that Jesus is not the center of their life. They've been doing life without you. They've been doing life apart from you. And God, the only way their marriage is ever going to heal, the only way their relationship is ever going to change is when you become the center of their life. And if that's you and you're at one of our campuses or listening online, I want to give you an opportunity to change that right now. Right where you are, you can just say a prayer, something like this in your heart, and just mean these words to God. Just say to him, dear God, I confess to you that you haven't been first place in my life. And I know that's sin, and for that, I ask you to forgive me. And I invite you to come in and be the center of my life, because God, when you are at the center, you change me, and you begin to change my relationships. You change the way that I live. You change the choices I make. You give me the ability to love and to forgive and to show mercy and grace and kindness. And so I just surrender my heart to you right now. Please come in and be my Lord and my Savior. If you just prayed that prayer, greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. And I want to pray for you as we close the service. And I'm going to ask you to do something really brave across all of our campuses. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. But if you just prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand so that I can pray for you? God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Thank you, God bless you. Back there in the back, I see your hands. God bless you. For those of you that are at campuses and online, uh, we see your hands, and I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, we thank you for every hand that's gone up today, for every person that has committed their life to Christ. We are grateful, we give you praise, and we honor you. I pray over the marriages here at North Star. I pray for the marriages in our community. God, help them to be better. And help us as followers of Jesus to create radical marriages that are rooted in you and that become a reflection to the lost world around us. For Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people together said, amen and amen. Hey, listen, I know that I'm a little over today. I hope uh, that you'll show me some grace. Uh, I'm passionate about this. I love our church, I love our families, and I love our marriages. And I want God's best for those. And so here at North Star, every week, when people commit their life to Christ, we celebrate that. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, let's put our hands together and celebrate all those who committed their life to Christ today.